What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Logic Bomb Podcast, and we are on episode 34. There's been a little bit of mix-up there, but we're going to uh, make up for that mix-up by having a special guest on today. We actually have Seb. He is a developer for Rainbow Six Siege. He's actually a product owner who really is very hands-on with the special events, and the timing is great here because the Sugar Fright special event just went live in Rainbow Six Siege. So we have one of the most knowledgeable people that we could possibly have on for talking about special events. We're gonna pick his brain about the creative process that goes behind these events, the uh, the decisions that go into them, you know, how long it takes to, to make them, all of that stuff is going to be answered in today's episode of the Logic Bomb Podcast. I'm really looking forward to it. With that said, uh, Seb, what's up? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know you. we were talking earlier before we went live. You've actually been with uh, the brand Rainbow Six Siege for, you said, eight years? Is that what? Or, or you've yep. been with, with – with, that's insane. So uh, definitely one of the veterans uh, with the game here. We're, we're really happy to have you on um, both – uh, Alex and I have got on and played a few games of Sugar Fright before we uh, started recording this, and uh, I'm very pleased with it so far, so uh, I'm excited to talk about this today. Cool. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Obviously, I'm, I'm glad we're going to make it work. <laughs> nice. Nice. Obviously, it's been a long time. Events have been ongoing, like for the past two years, we've been ongoing process. So yeah, it's it's fun to be here and talk to about events with you guys. How uh, we might as well jump straight into it. How the hell do you manage to to make the events? Uh, like, what, what's the, what's the process for um, for making an event uh, from like idea conception to actually getting it live? To understand the process, I think it's important to start with the first event that was ever done on Rainbow. Uh, it was the first Halloween. Uh, what was done is a collaboration between customization and the world team, so the map team. So I was managing the map team at the time. It was an initiative. They wanted to showcase the collection. So the sole purpose initially was to showcase collection. As we moved toward through seasons, we wanted to inject gameplay. And it was important for us that we have a platform to iterate on uh, new new features, new process, uh, new intention of game modes. So as we move forward, uh, we're trying to catch up on the calendar of the customization. So obviously, uh, we had uh, the Cowboy collection that was already in production. So we had to make an event, which was Showdown. And as we went along, uh, we catched up on the customization process, production timeline. So now we're able to define a tone and a team in the first place. So that's the first two bullet points that we start with uh, when we create an event. So we find a tone, we find a team, uh, the tone is, can be serious, comical, uh, horror-ish, and the team uh, drives depending on the season usually. So, so can I can I stop you one yeah. second? What oh, would you what, what, what would you say the tone is for the Sugar Fright event? Um, candies <laughs> and comical. Okay, what would Pretty you say good. the tone was for the Showdown event? Showdown was um, it was fire. We wanted to focus on the shooting capacity of the players. We want to showcase also the Bajji, which was a bit underrated at that time. Gotcha. Um, and we had some tech development. So the tone was really um, fast-paced gameplay. Uh, okay. The team was cowboy, obviously. Sorry for interrupting you there. I just kind of wanted no, to like no, get what you meant as far as tone and what that looks like from your perspective. Yep. Um, following that, what we do is usually dig through prototypes. So we always have a bank of ideas when uh, we start an event and uh, we know about the risk that we're going to get into. So we're trying to isolate the prototype or two prototypes that we want to tackle, start conception, start iteration, and then we uh, start the risk of the features uh, and all the implication with those features. Because sometimes a feature can be... Uh, a gameplay can be feature creep. What I mean by feature creep is that you need to add UX experience. You need to add some visual to support that. You need to add FX for it. So it's sometimes uh, stuff through the iteration that you discover. Um, just as a side note, Mute Protocol was supposed to be initially, um, what's it called? Um, when you hide as an object. I'm sorry, I forgot the term. I, uh, I know what you mean. The, oh, what, what is prop that game called? Prop Hunt. It used yes. to be a prop okay. hunt. So we didn't find fun with that. So we started iterating on the prototype that we had in the bank, like uh, far away was the uh, transforming from a drone and teleporting uh, as a player. 
So we started the rating with that. It wasn't fu uh, fun enough. Uh, we tried to give it to defenders. It wasn't fun. It didn't make sense in the gameplay because defenders don't have drones. So this is where Guillaume came with the defender's camera, the bulletproof camera that you could teleport to it. So as you build the event, as you take a prototype, there's some stuff that's getting had on to the event uh, to make sure that it's fun in the end. How really difficult is it like from when you when you come up with the idea? Because like you kind of mentioned ha with, with Mute Protocol that you you build this and then you figure out that this doesn't work. But I mean, you can't just give up there. So you got to find a, a fix for it, right? With with a, yeah. Is that it's is a, that a common thing that you always have to like find some way of still making the gameplay work, or does it sometimes just come easy? Grand Larceny was just adjustment. For example, when we did destroy the full floor, it came from a question: What if there was no stud? Literally, at at one point in the oh, yeah. meeting and the brainstorm, what if? Because at the first E3 when we shipped, uh, I remember Alex Remy went to E3, put it on stage. He was super proud. Came back and P he let it play in the hands of the player. And he says what we're going to do with the floor because no one knows where to breach. And this is where the studs came in and everything. Uh, so we did ask ourselves the question, what if the studs, what are the main issues? And we had some real issues with the three seats getting stuck. Uh, we were scared of the the bomb not dropping or stuff like that. But as it went along, we, we just made some adjustment to the gameplay. So the core was really, how can we make full destructible floor? How can we make an objective change room? And that was pretty much it. We're trying to, for every event, we have the team and the tone, which is strong, and we're trying to like embrace it. But as as a development team, we need to have features that we keep. Uh, otherwise, it's just a throw to the garbage and never reuse it. Sure. Um, Mute Protocol, Doctor's Curse, or that kind of exotic gameplay where it's hard to bring back some of those features, especially like the morphing. You don't want that in any competitive match. <laughs> uh, that would be so painful. Um, and it comes with really a, a bunch of restriction, a bunch of uh, core decision that affects the the game or the perception of uh, of the player through the game, through operators or stuff like that. Um, so I, in, in past events, um, have there have there been times where you've moved forward with an idea and then had to completely shift uh, shift the way that, the direction you were going? I mean, you mentioned like you originally mute protocol was prop hunt. So I guess yeah. w w what are what are the, what's the more typical for you to run into a problem where the gameplay just doesn't work, like it wouldn't be fun, or there's some other element there that just doesn't work for the player, or some technical issues, like. Uh, you know, we just can't make this animation look right, or we can't get it. We can't get the idea to work in game the way that we're imagining. Fun is first, definitely. The tech is second to me. What whatever tech I can gather afterwards, like this is second. Um, for example, when we took Doctor's Curse, um, it was super hard because we we didn't have any animation with no weapons in hand. So like this was a development that we needed to do. And we did that development saying, OK, what if eventually there's a defender or an attacker that has no weapon in hand? So like, how can we keep that tech and make sure that it is is bound to be reused or not, depending? But it needs to have, um, you cannot develop some stuff and just throw it to the garbage. It, as a production, it's not viable. You, you don't have Pyrenity uh, on this. Pyrenity, I'm not sure it's a word. Um, yeah, but you basically want to make it so you're guaranteed that if you ever were to use it again, you could. Yes, right? like, exactly. Like all the tech yeah. that gets developed, you, you don't ever want to make something that just gets scrapped fully. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. What about memory issues? And like, surely when you're like the Hereford uh, thing, the, the Grand Lasney, mm -hmm. <clears throat> with all that destruction, that's got to have been like technically difficult because we're not used yeah. to having maps getting that smashed up. No, definitely. But the floor itself are getting the same geometry split. So you still have that bullet when you shoot. It still makes those triangle. So it's the same destruction process, although it's a tree C, what you allow the character to do through that yeah. destruction. Um, studs offer a still solid collision, so you don't have, you can never pass through. But yeah, when it becomes very organic as a destruction, it becomes very complex, and this is the risk. And regarding performance, uh, definitely on some events, we decide to go lights on props. Uh, you've seen Stadium, for example. Stadium is a direction, definitely, that there is no cluster on the on the desk or stuff. But it also has some performance uh, bonification uh, through that process. 
Ooh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Stadium, uh, every time that I mention uh, in videos that I make, like map design and stuff like that, inevitably I get flooded with uh, people saying, bring Stadium back. Like that was that was one of the events that definitely sticks out to people. I think um, I think it's a different type of person. I think that I think that like um, Mute Protocol, Doctor's Curse, there's a type of player that plays that event like a lot and really mm-hmm. gets a ton of enjoyment out of it for a long period of time. And then there's another type of player that played Stadium for maybe a little bit longer um, because it, it, it more closely resembled what you would encounter in game. So do you do you find yourself struggling between trying to do events that would accommodate both of those types of players? I think we've set our general rule where we want two funny events and two uh, more serious events. I'm not saying that is this is going to be permanent because, um, well, it depends on the community, depends on what event we just released. But lots of people were talking about Rainbow is Magic, the tone and the team, and there was no gameplay injected to that. So, like, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, li- I like the variation. I'd like to have a pace of funny and a pace of serious because I think Rainbow is a very serious and tough <laughs> game uh, to learn. But through events, sometimes, like, even, like, for stadium uh the development was simple seem seemed simple but it was hard like we gave every operator uh to everyone so any newcomer who doesn't have access to alibi or nomad and they want to try it out before investing on them investing time in them they can use the event through that so i i would i personally as a proud owner i i really like having ser- the both side of the both side on this Clearly, a serious and a fun event to me is really appealing as a replayability and um, tempo also two seasons. I, I think it's nice to, like, when we get to try things like Mute Protocol, Grand Larceny, and, and the Sugar Fright event, like, it's something so far outside of everything else that we can do in Siege, right? Um, sure, we can jump in custom games and, and set up, like, our own rule, but it always has to be, like, gentleman agreement or or something like here you're forced into some sort of framework where it's completely different like running around on a map uh, i'm sure almost everyone has tried playing a custom game where you are defenders running from sledge and then we got the halloween event right that pretty much is a better version of that in every way Uh, i remember turning down brightness in game and playing like tower with defenders running from uh from sledge yeah i've seen that Uh, yeah. yeah and like it's hilarious to do that, but it's so difficult to do just as a player because you, you have to come up with all of the stuff and set up the rules. Here we get a like package, and then you can enjoy it for a set amount of time. And there's definitely going to be some sort of extra drive to it because it's limited. But I guess this leads into my, my begging part. <laughs> yeah, try me. The sugar fright stuff needs to stay. Uh, this is something that as far back as I can remember, everyone's wanted to try something like this. Um, and now the tech is is there. I know this isn't going to be your choice, but this is something that, that we need. Um, it's, it's really, really good. It is so many more times more fun than, than doing T-Hunt. Yes. Um, and I've only done it for... I played three games today uh, before we jumped on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm going straight back to, to playing it as, as soon as we're done. Um, all the all the bells and whistles. I, I appreciate them. They're fun, but the idea of being able to just jump in and instantly have some action uh, is is so important. I yep. think uh, I think we're going to be surprised with like how much people want to keep this when when it's over. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I just I wanted to throw that little one out there. When I became prod owner of the event, um, I play three games minimum a day for the past five years. Every day I play re- weekend, weekdays. Um, and when we took control of the event team, the ultimate goal was respawn because we know the shooting range, we know a warm up would be good in the game. So my goal as a prod owner is to influence production to take a product and develop it in the future. Uh, it may be their choice, uh, depends on the reception of the community but obviously respawn was one subject that we hadn't had the chance to tackle for ages 
And through the event team, I, it felt natural, but we had to make a long process because we had like release every season. We do ship a lot of events uh, through seasons. Um, so we needed to make the proper calendar to make sure that we could tackle this without any risk or minimal risk at, at least. Um, lots of events become like harder as you go. And if you don't give them the proper timeline, it won't be fun in the end. Uh, Doctor's Curse, for example, the invisibility, I'll be super transparent, it came a month prior to ship. We were playing the game and we didn't have invisibility for ages. And it was like on the side note, it was like, ah, that could be fun. Um, and at one point we had to integrate it because it was so hard, so one-sided, the such one-sided, like defenders could not survive, obviously, a sledge. I think uh, it was Pulse, Jackal. There, were, there was one which was awful. I forgot which one. One was <laughs> giving intel and it was awful. It's, yeah. it's fun to think that you basically had to kind of gamble that if invincibility was made and and added that then it would be then it would work so like do you had to role play while doing the the testing or how, how do you like get get an idea that once we add that this is probably going to be fine integrating the prototype is not long like just doing okay. the prototype itself and visibility is easy the problem is signs and feedback afterwards so I, how do you sign how do you feedback this to the player? As a third person, as a first person, what are do you need to make some special FX for it? Does it need to be? Does it need to have sound or stuff like that? So all those evaluation needs to be as you, to be done as you go with the prototype. But we never we always start prototype, but never consider them in production until they are the risk. So our goal really is to like fill the gameplay with a bunch of features, and then some of them are taken out if they cannot make risk, obviously. Can we can we talk a little bit about the process of inserting Respawn into the game? And I mean, obviously I'm not looking for a technical explanation of it, but yeah, sure. how, how hard was that to do? How long did that take to to, 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 to do? Um, was it, was it I, I imagine a Respawn system has to be, it seems to me like it would be really complicated. It depends what avenue you decide to take. Like when we there is the respawn feature, like we established what is the MVP. Obviously, MVP is respawn. Like I need to be able to respawn. So the first thing that was raised by the gameplay programmers was that it wasn't possible in the timeline that we had to have deployables. So Claymore is deployable shield because we needed to design what you do when you die. Like do you keep piling up deployable shields? Do you destroy them on the on, on the spot? Uh, how will how will it be perceived from the other team aspect of a perception? So that was a real issue. So we decided to build on that. So obviously, Ibana was not possible. Uh, and lots of operators were not possible. And this is the, the complexity and the difference on the Halloween. Halloween, we decided to, I will say the word denaturalize the operator. Um, because as we went along, obviously, the defend aspect and the attacker aspect were very strong. So as you develop, you know you can't do it on a consulate map. Even if you spawn them outside, there will be spawn peak everywhere. There will be uh, spawn kills everywhere. So we need to withdraw the defender attacks perspective and create two teams. And this is where the map came in. Because the map, obviously, on a respawn game mode is the core. Um, and with the little time that we had, there, there is, in my opinion, and we've, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard this name on podcasters. There's Yann Sylvestre, uh, director level design. He's been there for, I think, 12 years now, maybe even more. Um, he's been doing Rainbow Six for a long time. And there was one map which was core to the previous brands. Uh, it was Street. So when we decided to tackle Respawn, uh, his idea was like, let's bring back Street. So pretty much what we have. The working title of the map was called Street. Is that what you were saying? It's the original map. It's okay. the original map from Raven Shield, uh, from I think Vegas 2 had it also. So we took a legacy map from the brand and decided to bring it to Siege. Okay. Um, it had respawn in the previous uh, iteration, obviously. So we knew that spawn, that line of sights were good. So we did an uh, interpretation of that map, pretty much. And uh, we were able to deliver the map in about eight to 10 weeks production being able to test it afterwards and play it like on a daily basis, literally. 
So the the Sugar Fright map is actually a reskin map yep. from Vegas Two. Is that what you were saying? Vegas Raven Two, Shield. Raven Shield. I think it was even on Rogue Spear. I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's the benchmark map that we had on the brand for ages. Yeah. So it felt one on one for us. Like and Jan Silves did an amazing job. He's pretty much like. For Stadium, for example, you guys talking about Stadium earlier, he's deciding which map and like you cannot learn the map in six weekends, obviously. So how do you make it intuitive to the players and make it fun in the first few hours of play playing it? So having Airford, I think it was Airford and what was it? Uh there was some I Oregon there as well, I think. Yeah. Yes, Airford yeah. and Oregon were split into, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh so, and the staircase is from Canal. Possibly, because uh, yes, they were the, fully the, blocked yep. off and everything. Yep, uh, true that. it was it was like a, a mix of of maps that people already knew. So mm -hmm. even when you jump into stadium, because I think it took everyone a couple games to like figure it out when when they played it. But yep. you kind of knew where you were going, which yep. was yeah. a really weird feeling. Like there was this deja vu over the the, the That's whole. That's why directors are directors, and I'm a product owner, <laughs> <laughs> designers, <laughs> designers. Yeah. That's why we're players. <clears throat> so with the Sugar Freight event, did you guys ever toss around the idea of having randomized spawns? Or was it always the concept of one team will always spawn in this house and the other team will always spawn in this house? The initial design was we, we spawn in each house. And to prevent spawn kills, they wanted the red walls blockers. Um, okay. That was not doable, though. Uh, just the fact that you could hide in your base. And, and these are the exploits that you need to find in the core design initially on the paper. I, if I do stay as a, I, I'll say defender, right? if I do stay with my team in my own base, uh, I can collect, I can send one guy, collect uh, treats, and then come back to my base and I'll be safe. No one can catch a mine. So these kind of things we need to evaluate uh, beforehand. And the map spawns didn't look like that at all in the first place. Like you've seen, there's a drop on the second floor. Initially, we had pats on each side and made like spawn kill infernal, in fact. Uh, so we had to cut that. And uh, like having just one, we did a, a test. At one point, spawn kills were, was really an issue. Like we put Melo, we put Spooks in the team, we put Jacques Wong on the team, and they destroyed us. And it was, it was really painful. But at, at one point, once we did think that we fixed it, uh, we did put two guys in one team, so it was me and my death tester. I don't consider myself a good player that, in any means. Um, uh, and five very strong players. And we were able to manage to control them and even win the match because they sacrificed point over and over. And they they still take 30 seconds, I think. No, 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 not 30 seconds. Maybe 15, 20 seconds to get to your base. So in the overall defense, it felt quite balanced. I, I think there is still some issues. Uh, some that invincibility addressed in the reaction time uh, for defenders. But this is an iteration. Like, to me at this point, like, I'm looking forward to have the data to see where it can be exploited and have to take the proper decision uh, if ever event or feature be released ever one day. I guess you'd also have the problem if, if you were to, like, do randomized spawns because they're, they're never random, right? Like, they're always... Yeah some sort of a like you have to be x distance away from someone or outside a line of sight and you've got to do mm -hmm. all the calculations there yep. uh and even when that happens eventually if you keep it in for long enough um spawn locking becomes a thing right like people will find a way to make sure that they can guarantee that all the players spawn in a set position and then you can't get out of it like you have no option so it's almost easier to for for the players to understand if you just spawn at a and b and then you fight each other from there um, because for I've played a lot of shooters that have either domination or um, any kind of like TDM or kill confirm whatever, where it very very quickly becomes a default that if I run this and this far, I can make sure that everyone will spawn on this side of the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I th I think that would be that'd be a very sad thing if that was the first thing that happened in in an event like this. Yes, um, we wanted to get away from that. So obviously, respawn implies spawn kill risk. Sure. This was the first thing that we needed to uh, resolve. Uh, afterwards, everything was pretty straightforward, though. I'll be honest. Um, 
I, I really like the realization every time. Big up to audio, VFX team, world team. Like real <laughs> intro cinematic and victory dance has has become part of the MVP for the events, and so far, like they've been impressing me ever since. I yeah. do not manage the. Uh, that realization i do manage the production of that making sure that they have what they want but every time they come to me with some eccentric i will say a victory dance or any whole needs but we still manage to deliver most of the time all the intentions yeah, I the, try squeaky to do toys. I do <laughs> the, the squeaky toy sound when you get shot in the new event yes. <laughs> has me in stitches every time it like i was so confused the first two times i was shooting at people yeah yeah uh, that's one thing also the bullet impacts that we wanted to tackle on the halloween event like there's lots of things many features that we wanted to integrate like uh, signs and feedback for the respawn that you have a timer above uh it's it's said in the player card selection but every operators are two speed two armor and you do get 25 points every time you pick up an asset so 25 health back uh, whenever you pick up a bag so like there's lots of small development and I, I'm very happy with the seven because there's hundred percent of the features I can keep in the game and reuse afterwards. Sure. There's there's a maintainability that I have to. Now it's a a tech debt, I'll say. But it's as long as you reuse them as much as possible, definitely this is something very good for the brand and the players also because they'll get more features as we go along. What made you decide to make everyone two speed? Uh, I mean, a sh sure, balance probably, so it's the same for everyone, but um, wouldn't this have been a good time to, to test and see if three speeds are that much stronger than, than one speeds? And, or at least give people a chance to, like, let's say I'm a rook player all the time. Uh, I mm -hmm. can, could, could play that speed that I'm comfortable with. Um, or is it just to make sure that it's, it's even feel for everyone? It came gradually, I'd say. Uh, the first iteration that we did was with the operator's uh, weapon. So Frost at our AR, and it was very underwhelming when you faced the R4C. And um, so we did decide to switch weapons. Therefore, at one point, since they had no ability and no like legacy weapons or gadgets, we had to make that choice uh, of getting everybody on the same speed and armor. Like sure. we could have went like three, three and one for sure on the speed, but uh, Guillaume, Guillaume decided to go on two and two. And I think it's a from the community feedback. Uh, some people are saying like put every operator two two. Um, I'm not sure through an event. It's a nice place to test it. Uh, obviously, it's not the right operators maybe and the right mindset, but uh, with their ability. But. It was an intention to stabilize everyone on the same point. Like we want to have even uh, gameplay, definitely uh, from sure. either side. Yeah, and you get the same options for weapons and sights on both sides, and yes, yeah. everything's exactly the same, right? Yep, yep. It yep. Makes sense for sure. Um, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to is because this event is available in a custom game. Uh, I, one of the things I'm thinking about right now is uh, going in and just playing like one v one. With yep. and, and correct me if this is impossible, but I believe you could do Ella versus Sophia, and both would have the same pistol, correct? Sure. Um, yep. And then I think that would be really fun because you know, w I mean, one of the things that jumps out to me, even with just a few times of playing this, is you realize when you're playing in respawn how quick the time to kill is in siege. And obviously, everybody knows that siege has a one shot headshot. Time to kill in siege is, is quick. But when you're playing in a respawn mode, it's like holy cow! I just looked in that person's direction and. And they're dead now. And I think it would be cool to get, you know, to go one v one with a pistol on that map. I think it's, I think the the map's small enough where you can still do it and have some fun. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that there's unlimited possibilities for cool little custom games and stuff like that. The um, the custom game was with Golden Gun. Like everybody wanted custom game, so I, I tried it with Golden Gun. It did work well. After Mute Protocol, I got to be honest, I was a bit scared of leaving a full map to open 24 hours to people to find exploits or stuff like that. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. That was a bit scary. But at one point, I do need, as a product owner, I do need to offer a stable experience if you do have friends that you want to play with. So it was one-on-one. -on -one, like, if there is an exploit on the event and I'm not able to fix it in time, at least there is the custom game. But we made sure that we're shielded on that as much as possible. 
Um, custom game to me is a nice way to discover the map, especially when you have a new map. It's a huge map. Huh? Um, it's it's not symmetrical per se. Like it has that symmetrical aspect, but both sides, the east and west, are different. But the well, I I think we. Yeah, I think we get a lot from having a new map in custom game, just so you can learn and get the angles right and uh, exp learn to exploit the map. I will say the word exploit, but it's not it. Uh, it's really use the map to your benefit. Sure. Benefits. Benefits. Can we uh, can we uh, talk a little bit about the the mute protocol <laughs> you mentioned there? And like, I mean, obviously, you know, as you're describing sure. these events, and you know, it's when I'm, one thing I'm picking up is. I mean, there's a lot of work and a lot of moving parts in these events and, you know, a lot of people involved with making them come to reality. So mm -hmm. mute protocol hits and uh, obviously there was some some problems with that it had to be disabled for a short period of time and then it comes back in. Was that really hard? Was that a hard time for you? Was it hard to see that happen? You know, what was that experience like for you? When you release, let's say, an operator, you have a chance to fix it because it will stay in the game. Uh, when you release an event, the timeline to fix it for the bug to be reported, to be isolated, to be fixed, and then to be pushed with various platforms that we have is is very hard. So it is stressful. To me, it is stressful as I ship a new game. It's exactly a new game to me every time. Um, so since I'm a player and I'm really involved in the product, I, I do get emotional. Not emotional, uh, but I do care for the product. And it, to me, it's important that we learn from those mistakes. And uh, and, and I'd be, let, let's talk about Mute Protocol. Uh, Mute Protocol, for instance, when it released an hour and a half, I think two hours after there was that bug. That bug where yeah. you could get into the roof, in the ceiling. And uh, it's funny because as a development, like there is so many risks when we develop that game and uh, that game, that event. When we, the first thing you do is clone the map because you don't want to pollute the map. You want to make sure that the map is clean. So we did uh, clone the map. We integrated the features. And as we went along, the map was no longer a risk in my head. We thrown the drone everywhere in the roof and ceilings on the hatches just to make sure that there was no exploit angle or stuff like that. But somehow there's a hole in the collision that went through and nobody saw it. And um, that that's a mistake. There's no one to blame on it. Uh, we should have isolated that but it's when you move your priorities at one point the map was on priority and then we move the map keeps getting tested don't get me wrong it keeps getting tested there's graphic that's getting entered uh submitted but the risk of the production was more on the um, the transforming mm -hmm. like uh, i was morphing and then i had two seconds where i couldn't shoot or i had uh, no seconds i could shoot but the it box wasn't there and you can register a hit so like all those risks became very important to tackle, and we did move a bit away of the um, the other risk, which was the map and the drone, uh, because we did consider at one point that we isolated that. Some integration did create that all at one point, and uh, there was one bug which we did isolate. That, that one we've never seen before, uh, before it was released, sadly. Uh, but there was one where we used spam the morphing ability, and then you could spawn inside the wall. And that really scared me. It was 1%. I put lots of effort in fixing that one. But since the other one we've never seen before, it was never entered. Like, sadly, we didn't catch on that one. So it it is hard when you hit a wall like that because you look at your options. And uh, at one point, I was out of options of what I could provide as a timeline for a fix. So that's what's scary about events. Sometimes you just, yeah, you you deploy and then you you hope everything was done <laughs> properly by every other team so obviously i i can't fix all the bugs myself i don't fix even one but i do make sure that all bugs are fixed it's gotta be hot because i played three or four games and i was sitting there thinking dude this is insane this is so good and fifth game there's a guy in the wall yeah. shooting everyone yeah and i'm sitting there thinking okay well just this game well nope next game Next game, Ooh. next game. And then you start thinking, uh, it's got to suck for the people who put it out there because sure, there's some professional pride and you're super happy about the product coming out. But you can't like, you can't just click a button and have it fixed. It has to go through this whole process, right? Yeah. Um, yep. There has to be an update rolled out. There's some technical yep. things with that. And 
definitely. Uh, we're trying to find ways, obviously, to fix those <clears throat> on the spot. So, like, facing walls like that always brings something good to the game or to the production team. Like, we, we do face a wall. We know, for example, I'll be sugar fright. Uh, if you do leave, you get a penalty. Um, that penalty, this is something that we will address in the future in order to maybe just give the penalty to the playlist event, not affect every other playlist or stuff like that. So every time we face a wall, there's something that we need to learn from it. And this is my pretty much role to identify things we need to work on uh, among risk and among like new features and tension. I, I'm 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 fine with the, the lead penalty. Like people, I, I'm not. I I I, 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 <laughs> I I mean I play a lot of other games. Like in 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 a lot of other games, in casual ranked, it doesn't matter if you leave. There's a penalty associated with abandoning your team. I don't yes. understand what the problem is with that. Like, I, I mean, if you what? if you have an emergency and you need to leave, fine, take the penalty. You go and you do what you need to do. When you come back, the penalty will be gone. You know who cares. But if you're just trying to leave and then go jump in a ranked game, that's not fair to the people who you leave behind. So I, I'm I'm on board with this. I, I well, think the bigger you... problem... Go ahead. No, please go, please go. Uh, I, so I think, uh, what was the reason that penalty was added in the first place? Because surely yeah. it's, it's to not mess up everyone else because then you have to implement something else. You have to implement like a live queue so other people can get in, mm -hmm. uh, like, like you have in casual. And... What do you do if people just uh, like in Sugar Fright, for example, would you despawn the the confirmation kill thingies every time you left? Like, could people start abusing that, or would people just keep alterfing the game until they found one where they were doing good enough? Um, like that that would scare me if if it starts being this thing where you could never play against the same people. I'm super happy. I I haven't seen a single one leave. In uh, in all yeah. fairness, I only played three games, but. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very strict punishment. I will give you that. Uh, maybe it should be turned down a little bit. Uh, I, th I think right now it's it's the normal sanction system, right? It's the same as if yes, you yeah. were to abandon yeah, a rank. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be the wrong way to do it. Uh, yeah. But I'm completely fine with if you don't want to play, you can wait five minutes with queuing again. Uh, because whatever could have stopped you from doing it, you can either need five minutes to cool down um, so you're not too angry when you jump into the next game, or you had something to do for those five minutes. Um, the respawn and the one round thing really brought something. Like there was no way for us to make a joint in progress with the time that we had to make a joint in progress and let the people in spectator cam and not being able to spawn them and choose an operator. So that was one of the issue. Nonetheless, I, I'm not super happy uh, with that aspect of the release. Uh, this is something definitely I need to work on. Uh, if I do ever do a one round event, which I don't foresee in, in any time close, uh, this will need definitely to be tackled in the future. Um, but it's really the combination of respawn, one round, that forced us to use a type of penalty. But afterwards, we knew that we needed to develop um, something that was related to event penalty only. Uh, we suffered a lot in the past from events who were not Grand Larceny, for example. It, it was a fun game mode, but lots of match ended up 3v5 and 3v4 and 2v4. Yeah. And it breaks. We cannot guarantee to have a balanced experience and a fun experience having levers all the time. Sure. So we do had to hack as a production and design aspect of saying, how do we address this? And uh, Definitely respawn brought lots of concern with that. So we had to make a choice at one point. So either we don't offer penalty and we assume that we'll have a 2v5 match or we do offer, have penalty and yep. Is there a... Skill-based matchmaking has been a, a big talking point for a lot of people lately. Is there any of that in uh, in this event or is it completely random who you're playing against? Does it take into consideration to try and match like kind of equally skilled players? Because I can imagine if you have five pro players versus five newcomers, yes, that playlist is going to look a little different. As far as I recall, we take the casual uh, MMR. Okay. Like the hidden casual MMR. So theoretically, I'm really building on the matchmaking to be strong enough to be able to uh, like make you face some people which are your level or approximately it. 
Yeah, because like that would probably be a bigger balance issue than almost any weapon or gadget or anything you could do, right? If yep. if you have like full on new players against a bunch of diamonds or something, that that would be a a really rough time, especially with the uh, the time to kill and accuracy in, in siege. And depending on the event, like sometimes Doctor Curse, for example, which is a really exotic gameplay, you don't want to take those values. Those values are null, considered yep. null, like. It's irrelevant as a shooting since there's no gun. So we do uh, reactivate it from scratch. So you do start from base MMR and then you build up through the event. Yeah. So that makes sense. on Dr. Scourge, for example, probably the first few match you encounter in some very, very strong people. But since it's not the gameplay of shooting, theoretically, you're in the same condition as the uh, other. Yeah. You might even be a little better because you've memed a little more. <laughs> <laughs> there is that legit you chance. Know where to hide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that that was a that was just a quick like concern that it, I thought it, of if that it too. doesn't lead to some yeah. No, it is uh, a risk. As you develop the event, it's important to know who you're facing. So clearly, the matchmaking is a huge part and the uh, conception. One thing that I'm thinking about now, just talking to you. This is the third Halloween event we've had, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Look how far we've come since the first. I mean, the first one, and I mean, no offense to you towards this, okay? Uh, but the first event was literally, it, I think it was either Bomb or Secure Area. It was one of the game modes on house where the, the operators were dressed up in Halloween outfits and you had some pumpkins and some different yep. lighting and some smoke effects. And yep. now we have Respawn Sugar Fright. Doctor's Curse was last year. Like, look how far we've come on these special events. This is kind of, this is actually, it's it's, it's actually kind of crazy. That's what I like about the team rainbow. Like, uh, if certain people are very interesting in developing a product, like we we do what's called initiative. So you can build up a small team uh, and tackle that iteration, de risk it, and propose to director a solution or um, a design aspect to it. Um, this is what pretty much happened with the event. Uh, we started with just decorating a map, ended up to a product which was Rainbow's Magic, which was the most we could do. Rainbow's Magic was the top of what we could do in modification. I'll call it modification. There was no way that we could push that more. So having that base, we knew we couldn't last like two years having just a Rainbow's Magic event throughout seasons. We need to inject gameplay to make sure there's something different or flavor that people would like to test or play and as a development team there's some like you want to keep innovating you want you you cannot just sit on um, maps and operator you want new features to come in you want some so our job pretty much on the event it's bring new content that could inspire production director to move forward with the game Obviously, it hasn't happened so far. I'm expecting a lot from Sugar Fright, I'll be honest. <laughs> but, uh, yes, Same. Clearly. Yeah, yeah, that's the goal. Uh, if there's ever been a hashtag or anything worth starting, it's to keep uh, Deathmatch in, in Siege. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's uh, that's like going to be the golden standard of what well, we let's, should be let's, asking for. Let's let's establish it. Keep Respawn in Siege or keep Deathmatch? What do you think has the, the sharper ring to him there, Alex? Which should we go? R six respawn. <laughs> there you go. You with guys the, gonna get in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> with the with the rainbow is magic event, was there? Were you? I mean, I'm, I know you're, you. You mentioned like you're nervous because you care with every event, but to go from okay, Rainbow Six Siege is a pretty serious game. You know, there's a there's an element of realism there. There's a tactical feel to it. To now you've got Blackbeard wearing a unicorn headgear and pink <laughs> rainbows and stars and everything. Were you nervous that it was just going to flop? Like that, that players were just going to look at that and be like, no, this is not the game that I want to play. And was there any of that feeling going into it? When I first did the event, yes, there was definitely that feeling. Um, but they have a short-term longevity. So to me, it's no longer an issue as a proud owner because if it's not pleased, it's not offered for a long time. Uh, if people don't want to play it, they don't want to play it. My main goal is not to affect the main game. I want to provide a different experience, um, but the product itself is not meant to be, to stay forever. Um, if I take Sugar Fright, for example, you guys say this should stay. Um, my opinion, it needs to be developed as a 1.1 version. A bit like we did with Golden Gun. Golden Gun, as a first iteration, was very short, very simple. Uh, we just had a Golden Gun. I made, 
I won't say a mistake, but I did ask for an animation of the reload pistol and the special skin. I This is not my goal with arcades. I want arcades to be like a variation, but not necessarily customization. I really want to have a weekend event uh, where I can just change my mind of the regular Rainbow Six. But, but it was a cool reload. It was a cool reload, <laughs> but when you look at the 1.1, I gathered feedback, we gathered data, uh, we knew the map, map rotation was a necessity for it. Um, there was also the reverse friendly fire, there was lots of toxicity of players getting in front of people to get them, like, get the reverse friendly fire. So oh, we needed to tackle yeah. this in the first place also, uh, but it does create an issue, so on the next uh, release that we did, I think it was the 1st of October, uh, on that release, there was some also concern on that matter. So we're looking for next iteration uh, to see how we can tackle this. I, I really see a product as a, I won't say conception, but it's a release candidate, I could say. It's a beta, closed beta, I could yeah. say. And then I need to make sure that it evolves. Um, obviously, the events have become more important throughout the brand because they are seasonal, they have a tempo. Um, we do look for AAA quality on every event. so. I say close beta, it's a it's a triple A release, but we're looking to improve them every time. There's so many variations you could do on Sugar Fright. I mean, off the top of my head, shotguns only. Uh, I mentioned <laughs> I mentioned uh, Ella pistol only. I think that would be extremely fun. Uh, I mean, I, there's so many different things you can do with this. And all right, I, I I'm I promise I won't I won't beg anymore after this. But let me just throw in one little closing argument here. You're okay. To the choir. <laughs> okay. So so listen. I in the span of what a sugar fright game might last ten minutes, some, somewhere around there. I don't know. However long a sugar fright game is, in that span of time, I can get in approximately about maybe I'd say probably about seven to eight times the amount of gunfights that I can get in in a casual game in that same yeah. time span. So I know that you don't want your game mode to be viewed as a warm up. I mean, it, and it's more than that. It deserves more than that. Absolutely it does. But if I am looking for an efficient way to warm up, Sugar Fright, without a doubt, is going to give me more bang for my buck than any other way of playing Rainbow Six Siege. Gameplay wise, I don't think it's it's more or less than a warm up. I think you, you're right. It's, it's a warm up. It's somewhere where I can go 10 minutes and just shoot practice my aim and then get in a regular match it doesn't have the same pressure it does focus on the same skills my goal though would be to have the operators load out so if i do want to go practice with alibi i do practice with alibi right now the offer with the c7e ak12 and r4c is very limited um i think as a second iteration it's important to be able to change scope to change weapons maybe not weapons but at least the operator's weapon have abilities maybe, if not the, the abilities, at least deployable. Um, that was pretty much the goal as a first iteration. The map itself is super important also, like we've talked about the, the, sh the neighborhood map earlier. Um, having a symmetrical map in Rainbow is the first one. Like we have one outdoor map, which is Showdown, and we have one symmetrical map now. Uh, there was so many things we could not do, not having this type of map. And we had to make sure that that map was really ambitious. So it's big right now. And I, I did cut the sewers. There was sewers underneath. I did cut them because it was way too much at one point, especially for the time period. But as we evolve and inject new gameplay or new game modes or features, or if we do reuse that map, it's, if it's pleased, um, definitely we have now a tool or a, a square of sense that we can play with clearly. I just realized this is the only map, I at least, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the only map where there is no destruction at all. Yeah. Well, yes, yes, no destruction. There is destruction input, but yes, no destruction. There's no soft wall. There's no... Uh, I know you can shoot the clothes yeah. off the recruit cookies. Yep, yep. <laughs> Steve, Steve Labrec is a destruction artist on Rainbow, and every time on Evans, he did, does manage. He's owning the destruction, and he's done the Rainbow is magic, all the feedback, the squares, the flowers yep. that trying. And I was scared on Halloween that he would not have the tool to provide a good experience. There is so many things that you can hunt in there, uh, cars. That's why I opened it also in custom, so people can explore the map and see the work that Artis has done uh, on it. Is there any good uh, Easter eggs? Uh, there's a couple. The, the cars are crying to me. This is my most magical uh, 
like i <laughs> object in there like when i saw that the first time i was like okay this is this is useless but this is fun so like <laughs> yeah. every decoration in there is something more that you add like to the fantasy and uh yeah did you I, ever I, did, did you ever try the respawn game mode with destruction if so what did that look like there is lots of iteration that we've done on the destruction at one point we didn't even consider to keep the destruction between realms so if you did destroy your wall it would keep it would stay destroyed for the next that was round. a mess right yeah sure yeah, it, was, it was a mess it was a mess uh, that being said it doesn't mean that it cannot be done in a proper way i think it needs to be have more design maybe change the game mode change an, an aspect of it but the the goal really is to as you hit the prototype for example i'll take the mute protocol drone uh when they did first iterate that i guess they didn't find the fun on it there's some teams that can catch up on that and build something. Uh, it depends on the time you have to create uh, the ideas or design. But um, yeah. Well, it's fun because I, I remember like Flame and I have talked about it here before, long before it, uh, we, we got the, the TDM um, or the respawn mode. And we were talking about like if, if you were to do it in house, right? And uh, you just spawned in certain positions, like, it's it's such a difficult thing to conceptualize in your head. Like, what do you do if the wall is gone? Do you, right? Like, can we just not play after the rest or the the map is destroyed because yeah. now a reason why everything's messed up, right? Yeah. To be honest, there's a reason why it's not there yet because and it has to come through Evan because we tried it. Like, it's not as if the dev team did not say, uh, let's not do respawn forever and never tackle it. Like, we, yeah. we did tackle the issue. And I do remember that play session we did in house with respawn, and it was not fun at all. Uh, maybe <laughs> house, was not, house was probably not the right layout, but it had so many of the core issues that we found in that layout that the design issues, I'm, I'm no designer in any ways, but it was way too complex to address with the timeline and the, all the deliveries that we have to do to uh, season. Um, the event team is super small. Uh, the event team, we're about five or six people, and we do collaborate with every other team. So, like, this is the initiative thing. Like, if you do find a concept or features that you want to develop or invest in, gather the people, mobilize your team, and uh, make sure that you provide the fun content. That's pretty much it. So respawn in house, it's a no go whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. That being said, like if we do decide to invest at one point on respawn and do have a proper code, like very on the line of sight and stuff like that, that could be viable. But it's not an investment that is done other than the on the event right now. And it, we're kind of pioneers on that. Uh, we yeah. want to be the pioneers on that. We do have the time and we do have the platform to expose it and test it out, get the data. So that's our goal, pretty much. And it here, must feel good to add that though as well. Like j just knowing that it's possible and the feedback that I'm sure is coming in right now, it must be really nice to have like been part of turning on that little button at least for a little while. Well, it's turned on for the event. I'm not saying it's yeah, turned yeah. on for the game. No, no, but I, it, ex I, it, it is. Yes, now it it's is. proven possible. Yes, clearly. So now yeah. you're going to get more more community feedback on that. So in, in, yeah, enjoy that. <laughs> good luck. I will definitely, yeah. <laughs> The problem for you, I imagine, and, and I, I, I can sit here and I can say all day long, I do not care. If you introduce a permanent respawn game mode in Siege, I will view it purely as warm-up. I do not care about winning or losing. I'm, so if I go in there and I get spawn trapped, who cares? I'm just trying to warm up my aim. But mm -hmm. there's that, that's only me. There's a lot of people out there who anytime they play a game mode, they want to win. And they're not going to... You know, even if they're warming up, they they will kind of if they walk away from a game mode that's in a game that is doesn't feel balanced to them, then they will walk away salty. And uh, I mean, I think that I think that sometimes maybe me I get carried away with my perspective of who cares? It's just a warm up. I don't. It doesn't have to be balanced. It doesn't have to actually work. Who cares if the line of sight's there forever? I just want to warm up and do it efficiently. But if you're going to put something in the game, you have to think about more than that. And uh, I imagine that's the bigger challenge for you guys, making something in the game. If, it, if it's going to be permanent in the game, it's got to be deserving of it. It can't just be a throwaway game mode for the most hardcore of players. 
the one question that you need to address every time is what's your purpose? What do you decide to serve? Uh, what need do you decide to fill? And the uh, warm up, for example, is full of different needs. Like I could, I could just want to test a recall on patterns. So I would like to have all weapons in the showroom and say, okay, I go to that weapon, I test it, and I see, I check the recall pattern. I don't want to have to reload the the game and uh, pick another operator. So like, there's different needs that you need to fill. And at one point, it's hard to make the choice. It's not me who's making the choice. It's game directors, game designers. But they have to make the choice of what what we decide to invest, and if there is some part of the population which is not addressed or their needs are not addressed, what are the options to address those needs? So there must be I, some security difficulties as well, right? Like, like if you add a certain piece of tech, like maybe it could introduce a new glitch or a new yeah. thing that could like really hurt the like the, uh, things outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it works with with the coding stuff, but I could imagine like you add in uh, HUD to this respawn game mode where you can change and choose your gun, and all of a sudden we will have a person in ranked or unranked that can do the same. Um, yep. Like like it must be scary to implement that and then make sure that there is no loophole or way that it can can be abused. Or uh, the spawn protection, I guess, is a good example. Like yes. if I started seeing that in game, I would cry. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, 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 that's the biggest scare of the Evan thing. But it was um, it was something very scary prior to the last stadium. Once we had, did last stadium, we did rework the infrastructure, so we didn't have to copy the operator or uh, take the operator as was uh, as he was. Uh, we now are able to clone the operator, so we know that that clone will inherit anything that was done on the operator. So a bug was fixed on that operator, that fix would go through. But the, the, our goal was really to have an instance of it and not being able to affect the main game. So everything is hopefully compartmented uh, in one block. And this is what we've been working on as we developed the team. Like when we started, just so you know, when we started following Rainbow's Magic, I was not able to switch a weapon from another character to another operator. I was not able to give the budget to anyone. So it was tech that we was needed to develop. When we did develop that tech, it created some issue on the legacy operator on the original game. So we did face that wall and we had to act. So that's pretty much sums up where I came earlier. And I said, uh, every time you hit a wall, you need to find a solution and develop it. So as we go through event, we do unlock some technical aspect that will afford, that will allow us to develop more in the future. Like I could not take extreme risk prior to stadium because it was had the risk to affect the main game. But afterwards, it became a bit more open. That's why Mute Protocol was so ambitious. And I'm not saying I'm not going to be that ambitious in the future, but I'll be, especially in a working from home environment, this is quite <laughs> a challenge. I'll yeah. say quite a challenge. Um, but we'll, we'll make sure that those risks are really uh, managed in the less risky aspect yeah well it's good to hear that there isn't a, a big chance of a drone driving past me and a guy just spawning on the drone all of a sudden <laughs> well you know alex was saying that he would cry if he ran into spawn protection in the game if you give it to me we're good okay I, like <laughs> you give me give me 20 seconds of invincibility at the beginning of the round i'll take a mario and i will seconds? have i will have some Damn. fun all right i'll give it to Run you <laughs> In in the uh, in the sugar fright of it, the first time I saw a blue person, and I was like, I was like, what does that mean? Oh, my bullets aren't registering. Oh no, you know. And I figured it out real quick, but it, it was it, you know um, cool. And I, you know, the more you talk about this, the more I'm like, man, like the special events are kind of like the NASA of uh, Rainbow Six Siege. And, and and what I mean by that is like you're like creating the need to develop, uh, I guess, new tech in the game, and then that tech is used later in the game. For example, you know, we just saw Malusi and uh, Orcs just swap weapons. Now, mm -hmm. again, back in the day, that wasn't even a possibility of, of you know, switching operator weapons or giving other operator weapons, you know, so. No, I mean, it, surely it, they it could just be difficult. Yeah, oh, it, right. it was more oh. difficult and it had an impact on the game. So since you're working on the core game, obviously you can change Malusi's weapon. But on the event, it could not be done without affecting the main game. That was the gotcha. main issue. I, gotcha. It was a it was in the event aspect. Okay. So as you want more stuff in the event, obviously switch loadouts. Uh, it was needed. Uh, I assume there's also some 
there's got to be some R&D teams that just sit there all day and just try different stuff, right? Like, they they probably try, like, the weirdest, the best, and the craziest random stuff for operators and like weapons, utility, yeah, whatever. Like, like Valk having anything. the UMP or, like, Valk not being able to throw you'll, cameras outside. You're never going like to let Valk, <laughs> let Valk go. Poor Valk. Um, but you guys, I, I'm sure you get to go have a look there every now and then and say, you know what, that thing you're working on, that's actually pretty fun. Can we play with that? Like, th there's got to be some sort of... It, Milo, when we developed Showdown, he was developing, I think, Kelly at that time, and he wanted to have the sniper, like, fight. So he said, like, hey, can I get, can you set me up with Kelly in there so we will have a sniper uh, uh, Showdown? So I, I think we're getting it there. It wasn't possible before. Like uh, lots of speculation was done on the a the indestructible window in stadium. Is that an intention that they want to bring that in game? Like every team are doing their own stuff or their own iteration or own innovation. But since uh, we have gameplay programmers, we don't interact with the design uh, for the future operator. Mm. I do foresee it. I do see the tech they're developing. Uh, we can build on that eventually in the future but with the timeline of production that we had uh previously to sugar fright it was very hard to to merge this yeah like i guess the the plan isn't to make an event that automatically or is guaranteed to have anything to do with the main game from for, uh, for the rest of the time right is that whatever you make could be used Yep. that it isn't a throwaway thing afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the stadium windows. Well, now you have some sort of feedback on some people like it, some people dislike it, and you yep. kind of know how it works in the map. Mm -hmm. uh, and before it hits the public, it's really difficult to get an idea because things in in a prototype look very different than once they get released, right? You're going to have emotions and you're going to have like actual data. And both of those two can be very, very different than what you initially saw and what your planning was as well, right? There's so many skill gap in between the players yeah. that they are definitely using the tools that are provided differently. Um, I come back to the studs. When we develop the studs in the floor for destructible floor, me and Yan look at each other. Okay, this will be a pro player mindset. Like it's not the casual player is going to use that. And nowadays, like it's core to the gameplay. Like everybody's using the stud line of sight. So it's how the game evolves, how you get the data, and how you adapt to it through a various iteration. Uh, bullet penetration same thing with the map team like some deaths were had less bullet penetration they had to address it so as you build the product you get data and you get feedback and you adjust that's the beauty I'm, of being a live game i'm just imagining siege now with no no studs oh my goodness no that is my dream like imagine the lines of sight and <laughs> oh. <laughs> So many yeah. good YouTube videos could come from that. If you still learn from the game after five years, you would still have five more years to go for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, it's... that would be horrible to play. But oh yeah. my God, would it be fun? So without... A... Go ahead, go ahead. No, it's, that's the thing. It's sometimes you think your, your idea is super good, super strong, yeah. and then you end up on a server and you're like, okay, no, this is a mess. So oh. what is the opportunity? Event is a nice place. Obviously, I, I will make sure that it's always fun. Uh, but after it's the feedback that needs constructive to be, uh... and the opportunity cost is lower, right? Yeah. Like when you make it, you get feedback. If it ends up being really bad, at least it's just an event. Yeah. Um. I mean, sure, it's gonna hurt the, uh, the the team, and it's it's gonna suck if if people didn't like it. Of course. Uh, we're professional. But it, it, sure, but I mean, it, it, you know, if you make a product, you you still want people to enjoy it. Um. But but it's different if you implement it in like the base game, boom, here you go, and then people don't like it. You're like, oh, that that's gotta be way worse. So that it surely it's much easier for you guys to do some crazy weird things, and and get some more leeway on what you can do. I mean, you've just had a weird looking creatures running around respawning in siege, and yeah, I'm still not sure how to digest it. But damn, it's fun. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. My goal is really to build up on that. Like, uh, offer something that is sustainable in the future, can be built on, and can be delivered to other teams also to be reused. Without getting into any leaks, obviously, what, I mean, are you, are you, how many events are you ahead of time working on right now? Like, what's, what's the workflow look like in your, 
uh, in your department, I guess you could say? I always have to have one in conception and one in production. Um, that way I can allow my team to breathe a bit because uh, it is quite exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I would imagine. And I, I know that like, Correct me if I'm wrong. The way it works with uh, new operators, there's like there's game designers that kind of take turns with seasons. So you know, a game designer might have one per year, one season per year. I don't know the exact. I'm just kind of throwing a a, a a number out there. But with you guys, I mean, it's it's every season and it's relentless. Does that wear you out at all? I mean, do you do, do are is there a part of you that's like, oh okay, sugar fright went well, but now here we go. The next one's got to go now. It's, it's the manager who's affected because I'm not going to duplicate the managers. Uh, it's mostly the team of production that I want to make sure that they're breathing, that they have the time to be creative, the time to develop a feature without any risk, without the stress of timeline. So that's why I'm trying to create that tempo with the team. Um, and obviously, ambitions. Ambitions, this is something that you can like have on every event. If you don't manage them, you'll burn the team. So definitely my role as a product manager lead uh, is to make sure that the team has the tool and is in a position of success. If I do put too much work on their plate, they're not going to deliver. Everybody's going to fail. So the only way I can succeed in my work is to give them the tool and make sure that they are able to accomplish the task, which has happened. Yeah. You, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, well, I was just, so now let's get into leaks. Has there ever been an idea? <laughs> there, so no, I'm, so joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. But has there ever been like a, what, what's like the craziest idea that that made it like out of like brainstorming session, but that didn't work? Is there anything you can give us there? Like, is there anything like crazy that you? What, what's that? Prop hunt. The prop okay. hunt. This is something that we didn't want to tackle in the end because it wasn't fun. Um, what was not fun? Oh, there was one other that I just cut recently. It wasn't fun. I can't tell, obviously, because uh, I want, uh, to, build on it. I want uh, to build on it. What? No, what, what <laughs> okay, okay. What made right. prop hunt not fun? Sorry. What made prop hunt not work? Uh, camera control. The risk on the camera control, being able to switch from first person to third person, that was a real issue. Uh, the number of assets that you would need to transform was not an issue, but it was a production timeline also. Like uh, you, you need to fill house with many props, um, budget, performance. There was lots of risk, but the fun per se to me is always driven by the three C. So camera control and character. Uh, this is where you get the core of the experience and shooting, obviously, on Rainbow. Um, but in a prop hunt, being a prop and being hunted by five guys was very underwhelming. You had like you had nothing to turn around as a defender, if I could say. Um, but we did all echo cams. Sorry? <laughs> just give them all echo drones. Just sit there and stun people. Yeah, you'd have a cup hanging out on the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, echo, echo stunning you. Yeah. Um, you did. You did a tweet asking. Uh, I can't. I can't remember uh, exactly how it was worded, but but your. I think your tweet was if if you could design your own event, what kind of things yeah. would you like to see? Um, yeah. Just like a, a a question to everyone. Did you get any responses where you were thinking, damn, that's a good idea. I ne never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. The, the one, there was one response. It was Oryx on a multiple floor that could jump from hatch and could bump each other outside of the map. Like a bit of Fall Guys kind of style, like you bump each other. Oh my God, this that sounds hilarious. First thing in the next morning, I came back to the team. I said, hey, what if two Oryx <laughs> face each other? <laughs> the, or ev everyone's nomad it, shooting air jumps at each other. <laughs> I just tested and it crashed. So like this was, uh, <laughs> this was our first iteration. But uh, I do look forward to have like uh, community feedback on this, like uh, whatever events that they want to tackle. Obviously, the map itself was important uh, that we have a symmetrical map to tackle, like capture the flag, uh, uh, sweet aunt or stuff like that. Um, I'm sure yeah. you'll get tons of ideas in the comments below. Uh, Hopefully, because in, in a day or two. We do listen to all of them. Like I do, I do take serious any community feedback. Like even if it's a bug, uh, I, I do address it. I do try to isolate with the person. Obviously, I'm not Ubisoft support, but on the event side, I do like to be uh, representative. Hands yeah, hands on, and see what is the actual product. Yeah. 
When you look at these events, uh, I mean, if you're looking back, how do you define an event as a success? What are you hoping to accomplish? And you know, what are the metrics or the feedback that you're looking for that says this event was a success or you know, this event uh, didn't turn out the way we wanted? There's two variations. There's one which is product oriented and there's one which is product oriented. Uh, the product oriented is a feature, it is something that I will keep as a production and to be able to develop on in the future, whether it's a first iteration, whether it's a final product, it's something that I keep. Uh, it's really important because you don't want to throw money to garbage. The second one is obviously the fun and the reception. And after the fun and the reception, it's how you build on it. Um, but these are the two core KPI, my key performance indicator, I would say, as a product owner. As a product for the event itself, we look at the retention, the time spent on the event, uh, the number of times spent in between days, how many, uh, if you did connect the first day, how many days did it take you to reconnect to the event? So we do track all this data uh, to get a general feedback. Golden Gun, for example, we were expecting a low peak in the second iteration, second release, and that ended up being pretty stable. So that's the kind of data that we're looking forward. Like, so Golden Gun, we don't consider it as a finished product. We do consider we need iteration, but we do sense that the community uh, with their action, with their uh, connection are interested in having this a bit more often than it is. Yeah. When you look at those metrics, is, or is there one event that like outshines the other events or are they all pretty close to the same uh, numbers? Halloween. <laughs> Rainbow is magic. Wow. What? Rainbow, Rainbow is magic and stadium. And, and I will say Rainbow is magic is, has been my uh, uh, my Democlase word. I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, I kill uh, ill. Um, yeah. Be, because, because Rainbow is magic benefited from the 1st of April. It was the first event that came out and had that strong team of having, t seriously, Tachanko with the unicorn. Like, how, how more... Shock Fabulous game. Game. As, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it did benefit of that. Afterwards, it's an event that was meant to be a week and then lasted two weeks to the demand of the, uh, the, the players. Um, but as a production and a player, I do feel it's stale. I wish I could have that same tone and theme through every event because I think that's what's the strong aspect of it. Yeah. But if I look at the skins, for example, I'm more aiming, a, and uh, Halloween, you can blame me. Um, Halloween skins, I saw the concept art of that Halloween skin, and I said, I make an event with this. Um, <laughs> because we have that issue of having like um, operators that are not identifiable uh, in the layout. Um, and to me, this is a responsibility of Custo and also the event team and the game design team to make sure that any product that are coming out from the event are viable. Um, so having Jackal, for example, in Mute Protocol with a tin can over his head, he's looking nice, don't get me wrong, he looks good. But can it create some issues? Can it have like bad, bad feedback in a regular gameplay? And this is my role. So when I saw the concept from the puppet, it was one in one. Like to me, it was it addressed the costume aspect of the Halloween. We had the candy mindset, and it does respect the. It looks like a head operator. Yeah, and exactly. it's, it's it's not your it's not your played out Halloween skin. Like come on, like we've we've done every every single game out right now has a Halloween event where the characters in the game have like a vampire or a you know what I mean like it, it's and, and then here's Rainbow Six Siege we got Muppets <laughs> and we gotta, I love it we're gonna definitely play with this a lot um but yes I, I like that tempo uh with the custo and the events being serious being funny I I think it's important to have that tempo but the most important thing it needs to be viable in the game um and i don't think and this is pretty possibly just a north american way but i don't think uh halloween is always about horror if i do horror every year people will expect that so obviously following last year everybody was expecting something as scary as doctor's curse because doctor's curse was scary um but i i want to create that tempo and i want to influence the the teams so the players don't expect stuff every time, but they get surprised every time. Uh, if I do uh, April's Fool every year, it's no longer an April's Fool. 
Like right. people are expecting it. Well, I'm a massive fan of the suction cup smoke headgear and, and how disgustingly wiggly it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of happy that for the respawn mode that it was a, a bright, not, not in terms of like emotionally bright, but like actually the map being bright. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it isn't like, I, I can, like if there was cobweb or cobwebs everywhere and it was dark and difficult to see and everyone had scary uniforms on, I think it would be harder for me to see it as uh, a practice or a warm up, yes. which yep. is 100% what, like, I have no shame in saying it. That is the best warm up I, I can get in Siege. Um, so if that was diluted by being spooky and dark, that would probably bother me a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Although, credit to whoever made the, the wiggly smoke headgear. It's so disgusting. Yes. Clearly. Um, but, but yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think it's honestly pretty pretty good that it ended up being this way instead mm -hmm. um because well, like Doc dr skirts edgar one of the best example he has a fluorescent can over his head yeah. uh, from dr skirts and i love the headgear but it's definitely wearable in rank like obviously and by no mean i'll be plat but i will never be plat with that edgar <laughs> so <laughs> clearly this is something that i think we need to make an effort game design will are already starting to look in those customization to make sure that we don't replicate what we've done in the past uh, on these type of assets. No more tin can jackals. Hopefully not. <laughs> I don't I'll know. I, I, think, I think dying to IQG8 Muppet face might be the ultimate flex in ranked. Like I, I could yeah. like it's it's one thing it's one thing to get beaten ranked, but if you get beat by the Muppets in ranked, uh, yeah. you you got flexed on. I'm so. throwing my mouse away. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I won't get shot as the Muppet because he saw something uh, right. outstanding on my body or something like that. I only have a cowboy hat that goes above cover, like stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. The, the top hat on Blackbeard is still the best bait in the game. You repel up and they start shooting at the top hat and then, <laughs> then you peek with the shield. <laughs> Goodness gracious, you're you're gonna make me throw up just listening to this stuff. I'm good with that. <laughs> so, um, so uh, of the ideas that you get for these events, mm -hmm. do do most of them come from in house, and have any of them come from rejected operator ideas? Because I know this sounds crazy, but whenever I first saw Mute Protocol, I thought that maybe that might have been an idea for an operator at one point, and then you realize, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's not gonna work, but Maybe we can have a game mode with it. So is there any of that kind of bleed over there where like the, the game designers have said, hey, I had this idea for an operator. It got rejected, but here, you guys have it and see if there's anything you can do with it. Yeah, Mute Protocol is pretty much that. Like the oh. morphing was, yeah. was, a, was a prototype that was done a few years before, before the game what it was what it is right now. Um, they were exploring lots of stuff. I didn't know about that concept. Like it never went to the floor. Like nobody tested it. It was a small team who did it. So yes, some of those uh, back in the drawers uh, concept comes out through event. We do uh, we do listen to the community. So like the sledge uh, doctor's curse was inspired by the community. Definitely, I think it was a one v five in house that I saw in the first year of release with sledge running around the, in the custom match. Um, for matchmaking reason, we had to make it five on five, and um, yeah, we had to make design choices uh, following that that call. But uh, we're trying to get ideas from pretty much everywhere. Uh, we have a, a clean slate. We can do pretty much anything that's feasible. So we're trying to dig on exotic ideas, but also game modes, uh, stuff that could be iterated and then developed on in the future. If you had endless funding, time, and everything to do whatever event you wanted to do, what would you make? Huh. Oh. <laughs> XCOM, top view, with AP points. I would oh go, my I would god. Dare, I, would go, I would dare go that way. I, I would see house with operators, termite, uh, being able to breach a wall, XCOM style with turn base. Like I a... Would, Spectre the cam zooms up and yeah. it's basically like watching your own little pro league match, but you could move them. Or, oh my God, that would be wow. sick. Wow. To, to me, this is where, and I'm not saying in any sense that I'm going to tackle this. Obviously, this is out of the, the scope, but if I, I did have um, the time, the Endless resources. Yeah. 
uh, I would definitely bring that kind of experience to see because Siege is such a core uh, core game. Like it has so much depth in its gameplay. I think there's so many features that can be exploited in different uh, aspect, a different type of games. Um, I'm a huge chess player. I really love chess, and this is where I find in Rainbow Six that I could use my strategy not as a chess player, obviously, but as the um, as observation, stra strategical. Uh, so yes, to me, endless possibilities. I would dare testing anything. Yeah. Give us a chess with a siege operators and a destructible board. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you're reaching out to the bishop. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> sledge the king. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that beats a chunk on one side and uh, Sophia yeah. on the other. We could do we could do the Ash playlist where everybody just has like the tiniest head. I mean, like a microscopic head, and then like normal bodies. That would be the Ash like playlist. Old school uh, Golden Eye, big head mode. <laughs> there, you, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, anything else that you wanted to go over with with Seb Alex? Is there anything else on your agenda that we that we missed? Uh, no. Uh, response good, and we should keep it. <laughs> and thanks so much for coming, man. Like I really yeah, appreciate it. And thanks, thanks, thanks so much for the work that you and your team. Like, I look forward to your events every season so much. It's just a nice breakup from, you know, the, the seriousness and the sweatiness and the frustration that can be siege sometimes. I look forward to the events just to hop in and have some fun. I look forward to the cosmetics as well. I mean, I'm one of those guys. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Because I know it can't be easy, especially in these challenging times. And, I mean... Frankly, I mean, the events have not, you know, gone down in quality as far as I'm concerned. I think that, if anything, they've, they've been raised over the last year. So um, thank you so much for that. Pleasure. Glad you like it. Looking forward to see your reaction on the future event release then. <laughs> Enjoy uh, Sugar Fright while it lasts. We will Love do our you. best. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to jump in in uh, five minutes, I think. Yeah, me Pretty too. Um so uh, we will. Uh, I'm gonna put your Twitter uh, down below. Anybody that wants to interact with uh, Seb, he is on Twitter. There, you can interact with him there. Um, again, please pass on to the rest of your team. Uh, great work, and thanks for everything that you're doing. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Let's do it again sometime. Uh, maybe we can make this like a yearly thing where you come on and give us like a a, a year in event roundup or something like that. I think that would be really cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. It was very fun. Thanks, guys. All right, well, Thank we're going to sign off. We will see you guys on the next one.